The Labors of Hercules. Forward. Hercule Poirot's flat was essentially modern in its furnishings. It gleamed with chromium. Its easy chairs, though comfortably padded, were square and uncompromising in outline. On one of these chairs sat Hercule Poirot, neatly in the middle of the chair. Opposite him, in another chair, sat Dr. Burton, fellow of All Souls, sipping appreciatively at a glass of Poirot's Chateau Mouton Rothschild. There was no neatness about Dr. Burton. He was plump, untidy, and beneath his thatch of white hair beamed a rubicund and benign countenance. He had a deep, wheezy chuckle and the habit of covering himself and everything around him with tobacco ash. In vain did Poirot surround him with ashtrays. Dr. Burton was asking a question. Tell me, he said, why, Hercule? You mean my Christian name? Hardly a Christian name, the other demurred. Definitely pagan. But why? That's what I want to know. Father's fancy? Mother's whim? Family reasons? If I remember rightly, though my memory isn't what it was, you had a brother called Achille, did you not? Poirot's mind raced back over the details of Achille Poirot's career. Had all that really happened? Only for a short space of time, he replied. Dr. Burton passed tactfully from the subject of Achille Poirot. People should be more careful how they name their children, he ruminated. I've got godchildren, I know. Blanche, one of them, is called Dark as a Gypsy. Then there's Deirdre, Deirdre of the Sorrows. She turned out merry as a grig. As for young Patience, she might as well have been named Impatience and be done with it. And Diana, well, Diana, the old classical scholar shuddered, weighs twelve stone now, and she's only fifteen. They say it's puppy fat. But it doesn't look that way to me, Diana. They wanted to call her Helen. But I did put my foot down there. Knowing what her father and mother looked like, and her grandmother, for that matter. I tried hard for Martha or Dorcas or something sensible. But it was no good. Waste of breath. Rum people, parents. He began to wheeze gently, his small fat face crinkled up. Poirot looked at him inquiringly. Thinking of an imaginary conversation, your mother and the late Mrs. Holmes, sitting, sewing little garments or knitting, Achille, Hercule, Sherlock, Mycroft, Poirot failed to share his friend's amusement. What I understand you to mean is what in physical appearance 
I do not resemble a Hercule. Dr. Burton's eyes swept over Hercule Poirot, over his small, neat person, attired in striped trousers, correct black jacket, and natty bow tie, swept up from his patent leather shoes to his egg-shaped head and the immense moustache that adorned his upper lip. Frankly, Poirot, said Dr. Burton, you don't, I gather. He added that you've never had much time to study the classics. That is so. Pity, pity. You've missed a lot. Everyone should be made to study the classics, if I had my way. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Eh bien, I have got on very well without them. Got on, got on. It's not a question of getting on. That's the wrong view altogether. The classics aren't a ladder leading to a quick success like a modern correspondence course. It's not a man's working hours that are important. It's his leisure hours. That's the mistake we all make. Take yourself now. You're getting on. You'll be wanting to get out of things. To take things easy. What are you going to do then with your leisure hours? Poirot was ready with his reply. I am going to attend seriously to the cultivation of vegetable marrows. Dr. Burton was taken aback. Vegetable marrows? What do you mean? Those great swollen green things that taste of water? Ah, Poirot spoke enthusiastically. But that is the whole point of it. They need not taste of water. Oh, I know. Sprinkle them with cheese or minced onion or white sauce. No, no. You are in error. It is my idea that the actual flavour of the marrow itself can be improved. It can be given, he screwed up his eyes, a bouquet. Good God, man, it's not a claret. The word bouquet reminded Dr. Burton of the glass at his elbow. He sipped and savoured. Very good wine, this. Very sound, yes. His head nodded in approbation. But this vegetable marrow business, you're not serious. You don't mean, he spoke in lively horror, that you're actually going to stoop? His hands descended in sympathetic horror on his own plump stomach. Stoop? and fork dung on the things and feed them with strands of wool dipped in water and all the rest of it. You seem, Poirot said, to be well acquainted with the culture of the marrow. Seen gardeners doing it when I've been staying in the country. But seriously, Poirot, what a hobby. Compare that to, his voice sank to an appreciative purr, an easy chair in front of a wood fire in a long, low room lined with books. Must be a long room, not a square one. Books all round one. A glass of port and a book open in your hand. Time rolls back as you read, he quoted sonorously, translating from the Greek. By skill again, the pilot on the wine dark sea straightens the swift ship buffeted by the winds. 
Of course, you can never really get the spirit of the original. For the moment, in his enthusiasm, he had forgotten Poirot. And Poirot, watching him, felt suddenly a doubt, an uncomfortable twinge. Was there, here, something that he had missed? Some richness of the spirit? Sadness crept over him. Yes, he should have become acquainted with the classics, long ago. Now, alas, it was too late. Dr. Burton interrupted his melancholy. Do you mean that you really are thinking of retiring? Yes, the other chuckled. You won't. But I assure you, you won't be able to do it, man. You're too interested in your work. No, indeed. I make all the arrangements. A few more cases, specially selected ones. Not, you understand, everything that presents itself. Just problems that have a personal appeal. Dr. Burton grinned. That's the way of it. Just a case or two, just one case more, and so on. The prima donna's farewell performance won't be in it with yours, Poirot. He chuckled and rose slowly to his feet. An amiable white-haired gnome. Yours aren't the labours of Hercules, he said. Yours are labours of love. You'll see if I'm not right. Bet you that in twelve months' time you'll still be here and vegetable marrows will still be, he shuddered, merely marrows. Taking leave of his host, Dr. Burton left the severe rectangular room. He passes out of these pages not to return to them. We are concerned only with what he left behind him, which was an idea. For after his departure, Hercule Poirot sat down again slowly, like a man in a dream, and murmured, The labours of Hercule. Mais oui, c'est une idée, ça. The following day saw Hercule Poirot perusing a large, calf-bound volume and other slimmer works with occasional harried glances at various typewritten slips of paper. His secretary, Miss Lemon, had been detailed to collect information on the subject of Hercules and to place same before him without interest, hers not the type to wonder why, but with perfect efficiency Miss Lemon had fulfilled her task. Hercule Poirot was plunged headfirst in a bewildering sea of classical lore with particular reference to Hercules, a celebrated hero who, after death, was ranked among the gods and received divine honours. So far, so good. But thereafter, it was far from plain sailing. For two hours, Poirot read diligently, making notes, frowning, consulting his slips of paper and his other books of reference. Finally, he sank back in his chair and shook his head. His mood of the previous evening was dispelled. What people? Take this Hercules, 
this hero, hero indeed. What was he but a large, muscular creature of low intelligence and criminal tendencies? Poirot was reminded of one Adolphe Duran, a butcher who had been tried at Lyon in 1895, a creature of ox-like strength who had killed several children. The defence had been epilepsy, from which he undoubtedly suffered. Though whether grand mal or petit mal had been an argument of several days' discussion. This ancient Hercules probably suffered from grand mal. No, Poirot shook his head. If that was the Greeks' idea of a hero, then, measured by modern standards, it certainly would not do. The whole classical pattern shocked him. These gods and goddesses, they seemed to have as many different aliases as a modern criminal. Indeed, they seemed to be definitely criminal types. Drink, debauchery, incest, rape, loot, homicide, and chicanery, enough to keep a juge d'instruction constantly busy. No decent family life, no order, no method, even in their crimes, no order or method. Hercules indeed, said Hercule Poirot, rising to his feet, disillusioned. He looked round him with approval. A square room with good square modern furniture. Even a piece of good modern sculpture representing one cube placed on another cube and above it a geometrical arrangement of copper wire. And in the midst of this shining and orderly room himself, he looked at himself in the glass. Here, then, was a modern Hercules, very distinct from that unpleasant sketch of a naked figure with bulging muscles brandishing a club. Instead, a small, compact figure attired in correct urban wear with a moustache. Such a moustache as Hercules never dreamed of cultivating. A moustache magnificent, yet sophisticated. Yet there was between this Hercule Poirot and the Hercules of classical lore one point of resemblance. Both of them, undoubtedly, had been instrumental in ridding the world of certain pests. Each of them could be described as a benefactor to the society he lived in. What had Dr. Burton said last night as he left? Yours are not the labours of Hercules. Ah, but there he was wrong, the old fossil. There should be, once again, the labours of Hercules, a modern Hercules, an ingenious and amusing conceit. In the period before his final retirement, he would accept 12 cases, no more, no less. And those 12 cases should be selected with special reference to the 12 labours of the ancient Hercules. Yes, that would not only be amusing, it would be artistic. It would be spiritual. Poirot picked up the classical dictionary and immersed himself once more in the classical lore. He did not intend to follow his prototype too closely. There should be no women, 
no shirt of Nessus, the labors and the labors only. The first labor, then, would be that of the Nemean lion. The Nemean lion, he repeated, trying it over on his tongue. Naturally, he did not expect a case to present itself actually involving a flesh and blood lion. It would be too much of a coincidence should he be approached by the directors of the zoological gardens to solve a problem for them involving a real lion. No, here symbolism must be involved. The first case must concern some celebrated public figure. It must be sensational and of the first importance. Some master criminal, or alternately, someone who was a lion in the public eye. Some well-known writer, or a politician, or painter, or even royalty. He liked the idea of royalty. He would not be in a hurry. He would wait, wait for the case of high importance that should be the first of his self-imposed labors.